Greetings to the brethren. Uh, I greet you all in the name of our Lord Christ Jesus. I just have a quick video for you guys today, something that I thought was interesting. So earlier in the day, I came up with a plan uh, because my friend was talking to me and they were like, yeah, yo, have you seen this Sam Harris video? Uh, you know, he totally destroys Christianity or something. So I was watching the video and I was like, Looking at Sam Harris, who, if you don't know him, he's kind of a popular atheist intellectual. He thinks the God of the Bible both doesn't exist and also is super evil and da 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 da, you know. And so I was watching the Sam Harris video and he was kind of making some arguments like, well, you know, huh, if there was a God, why would he let all the children die who have uh, diphtheria or something? Clearly that shows that God doesn't exist, but if he does, he's evil and or he's just weak and can't even do anything. And then everyone just claps. It's like, he's so wise. You know, anyway, so as I'm watching the video, I'm like, I'm just seeing all these logical flaws in his argument. And I'm like, oh man, I could totally refute this. You know, he said this that contradicts this that he said, and he put this forth, but it has this logical flaw. So I started getting all ready to make like a refutation because I was like, you know, these people, the new atheists or whatever, they're supposedly so logical and intellectually powerful, but a lot of times they actually have like really lazy arguments that if you just point out one thing about it, it's as if they didn't even bother to check if their own argument has any weaknesses because they're just so sure that like the Bible's absurd and God doesn't exist that they're kind of just like, well, obviously they didn't, you know, where you must be right. And then, so anyway, I was getting ready to make like a refutation of it. And I was like, you could refute it like this and you could point this out. I was starting to get all excited about it. Like I found like six flaws in his argument and I was going to like make a video about it. But then I paused and I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, you know, is this a good thing for me to do to like study his argument and analyze it from every point and then refute it? And I thought the Lord was going to say, yes, Evan, go for it. But he said, no. And I was like, no. So I spoke with the Lord a bit about it. And basically the Lord tells me that the people who are kind of making these arguments, their heart is so set on what they believe that you can sit there and you can logically show all the flaws in it. It's not going to change their heart because they've you know, they've set their heart on thinking the Bible's a joke and no matter how much logic you throw at them, it's not going to change their heart, which of course made me remember the scripture of, you know, they didn't believe Moses and the prophets. They're not going to believe even if one rises from the dead, because after all, the Lord gave them the word of God. He engineered all of history. If all of that wasn't enough to get them to actually think that maybe there is a God and question it, then surely my video is not going to do it if everything God already did didn't do it. The fact is they've been given over to the strong delusion because of their own choices that they made. And, you know, basically God told me I'm wasting my time if I'm trying to reach these people using a bunch of logic. And also it fits with the book of Proverbs that said you shouldn't rebuke a scorner or rebuke a fool because then they'll just hate you and it won't even accomplish anything useful, you know, casting pearls before swine. So I gave up that plan. Uh, but then I asked the Lord, Lord, you know, what can I do, Lord? I wanted to make some kind of thing I could work on and think about. And so the Lord told me, he said that my time was much better spent studying his word, seeing what I could understand from it, and then bringing it before the brethren, bringing it before the other sheep so that I could try to feed them and that they would actually, you know, maybe listen to what I had to say. So I wouldn't be wasting my time ranting at a bunch of atheists or whatever. Instead, I could try to do something useful with my time by bringing it to you guys, the brethren, as so that we can all understand the word of the Lord better. And it makes a lot of sense because why spend hours studying the arguments of these atheists, or people that just mock God and so on, when really you should be using your mind to study this because this is far richer, more complex and has the wisdom of God versus a bunch of stuff that basically is just like one liners about how all the religious people in the world are complete brainless dolts. And yet we should worship AI and how science is going to save us all and all that stuff. So Anyway, so I was like, okay, Lord, hit me with it. Let's pick a new part of the scripture to try to understand. So I opened up the scripture and instantly I saw this, the book of Habakkuk. Now my reaction was, who is Habakkuk? Never even heard of Habakkuk or if it's Habakkuk, I don't even know. But anyway, it was only like a page long. So I was like, okay, let's read the book of Habakkuk and see if I can understand what it's talking about. So I read through it. And I don't, certainly I don't understand all the details of it, but from what I can tell, uh, this is what it's saying. And it's interesting because right away it was talking about the very same issue that Sam Harris had brought up in his video when he was like, ha, ah, look at all the tragedy and evil in the world. Clearly that shows there is no God. Right away, it starts off with this, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, Habakkuk's complaint. And right away, it's Habakkuk basically saying the exact same thing. 
So I'm going to kind of summarize it here a little bit. But basically, Habakkuk starts off, and he's he's a prophet back in the old school days of the Old Testament. And he basically says, Lord, why is there so much wickedness in the world? Why am I seeing this? Everything around me is corrupt. Unrighteousness is spreading. I think this was during a period when Israel was like really falling away. And he, he basically says, Lord, this is absurd. Everything is just unrighteous. Everything is a disgrace. You know, what what is the point of all this? You know, so then the Lord answers and the Lord basically says, watch this. He says, I'm going to use this, all this chaos, all this evil to do something incredible that you wouldn't even believe if you, if I told you I was going to do it, but you're going to witness it with your own eyes. I'm going to use all this to do an incredible work. And so he talks about how the, the Chaldeans who I, are they the same as the Babylonians? I'm not sure they may be, or they may not be basically they're heathen, they're non-believers, they're going to come in and just take everything over and they're super vicious and evil. And the Lord says, basically, I'm going to allow them to do this. And I think part of it is probably Israel's getting punished because Israel's fallen into idolatry. But basically, the Lord's going to allow these unrighteous, evil people to kind of storm into the land, do all this terrible stuff, just kind of like take over. But ultimately, he's going to use it to perform uh, what he says. The Lord says this, Behold ye among the heathen and regard. And wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. He doesn't go into a ton of detail about what exactly that work is, but he's like, watch, I'm going to use all this evil to do something incredible. So, and he talks a little bit about the details of it. The Chaldeans are going to take over and be super evil. So then Habakkuk or Habakkuk says, uh, his second complaint, he basically says, I'll read this part of it. He says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? So he basically says, Lord, you can't even, you don't even like to look at evil. So how are you just letting all this evil happen without any kind of justice? He basically goes on and says, these super evil people are just snatching everyone up in a net and just devouring everyone. And how is it that you are not even doing anything, Lord? You know, and he basically just says, are you just going to let us go on in this seemingly orderless state of chaos with evil triumphing? I thought you were like the God of justice. How come you're not responding or doing anything? Why are you letting this all happen? The first thing I noticed was I was like, isn't it fascinating that God that comes and talks to him when he says this stuff? Because you might think that if you're like, Lord, you're unjust. Why are you doing this? That the Lord would just like ignore you or something because you're like complaining. The Lord doesn't react like that. He comes and starts engaging with the guy. So I think that's interesting because it kind of fits into the theme of relationships that like anyone who's had experience with relationships, you know, what do you do if you have an issue in the relationship? What's What do you do if you have a good relationship? Well, you bring it to your partner. You say, look, I have a problem with this whatever it is, you, you bring it out in the open, you talk about it. So here you see the Lord doing something which is a little surprising because you could imagine that the Lord just totally ignores you. If you complain, he's like, how dare you complain about my mysterious ways? And he just burns the guy up. Never question me. And everyone's like, oh, never complain about what the Lord does. But he doesn't react like that. He actually comes down and starts talking to the guy. When the guy's like, Lord, this is all twisted and evil. What's the point of this? The Lord comes and starts talking to him. So again, the Lord wants the same thing you want, which is to have a good relationship with you. So if you bring your complaint to the Lord. And I think this applies not just with, you know, the overall things of society, but with your personal life. Instead of just having it on the inside, talk to the Lord. Say, Lord, I don't understand this. Why are you doing this? The Lord likes that because you're engaging with him and it helps you improve your relationship with him. So that's the first interesting thing is the Lord comes and talks to him about it. He doesn't just, he doesn't just rebuke him for asking the question. He's like, yeah, let's talk about this. Check this out. I'm doing something incredible with this. So after Habakkuk's like, what, you're just going to let all the evil prosper? What's going on here? The Lord replies and he tells Habakkuk to kind of write down this vision that he's going to show him, this sort of prophecy of the future, all the stuff that's going to happen. But the most important thing is when he says right here, he's talking about, um, I think he's talking about the evil ruler of the Chaldeans, but I'm not entirely sure. He says, behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. This could also be the people that think that they're righteous, but they're not. But then the Lord says, but the just shall live by his faith. And that's like a recurring theme throughout the scripture. You got to live by faith, live by faith. So then 
the Lord says, goes on about the Chaldeans and all the evil stuff they're doing and how it's all going to kind of turn back on them at some point. And he gets, talks about idolatry and how it's totally pointless. It's not going to save them in the end. And uh, basically what he tells Habakkuk is you got to have faith. You got to be patient. I'm doing something with all this. Have faith in me. Be patient. The righteous are going to live by faith. So he describes some of the prophecy, all this really crazy stuff that's going to go down. And then Habakkuk says a prayer, which basically seems to be like, yo, Lord, come in and just light it up. Day of the Lord style. Do like you did back in the day, taking out evil. And he just describes it in all this terminology. Like it's going to be epic. The whole earth is going to shake. Like it's just going to be fearsome. Interesting how whenever they describe the Lord coming, it's not like, and he drifted down and everyone was happy. You know, I'm, I'm sure that like when they come up with the false aliens, antichrist, AI, fake, counterfeit, they're going to be like, oh, they're coming in peace to unite us all. And like, but when the real living God comes, what we see from all the imagery, also in the book of Zephaniah, which is the one right after this, it just describes this fearsome imagery that the land is just full of sin. The Lord is just lighting stuff up. People are just collapsing because of fear. It's like the most fearsome thing you could imagine. But basically, the moral of the story is that the Lord says, have faith, be patient. And Habakkuk says, Lord, come like you did in the old days, just light it all up. You know, but, you know, shield the, the righteous ones in your day of wrath. And that's essentially what the Lord says he's going to do, uh, which is that in the end, the wicked are going to get their just desserts. And when the Lord fearsomely comes and, and does his thing and just cleanses the earth of evil, he's also going to shield the righteous. He'll protect them. He'll hide them in the day of the Lord. And then presumably he's going to turn over to them, the newly cleansed, you know, kingdoms, and he's going to restore order. So the evil are going to get punished and the good are going to get rewarded. And so Habakkuk kind of gives a prayer for this to happen. But then the most significant thing is, um, yeah, and he says uh, at the very end of it, when I heard my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. And so the most important thing at the very end is that, it says Habakkuk rejoices in the Lord. And this is the real key part of it here that I think for me was the most touching part of the whole. Well, it's only like a page long. The most touching part of it all was this. Habakkuk says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hind's feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places, to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. And so basically, if you had to sum up the whole thing, Habakkuk or Habakkuk complains that evil's taken over everything. God says, yes, it is, but it's part of my deeper plan. Check this out. I'm doing something incredible with this. He reminds Habakkuk to have faith. The righteous have to live by faith. God will do what he always did back in the day. It just takes time. And in the end, Habakkuk learns that even if stuff is just all falling apart, even if the vines don't produce fruit and everything is falling to pieces, I will still have faith. And it reminded me a lot of the book of Job. When Job gets stricken down by Satan's attack and his family slaying, and he says something like, even though the Lord has stripped me down, yet will I have faith in him. I'm re-upping on the name of the Lord. <laughs> That's my paraphrase of it. So that seemed to be the same thing that Habakkuk came to at the end. And what the whole thing made me reflect on was how important patience is. The Lord will do what he's going to do. He always does it. He's done it since the beginning. But a key part of faith is patience. We got to have patience because the Lord doesn't just do it right away. And fools are led astray by essentially seeing things in the world, seeing chaos and thinking, ha, that shows there is no God. But if you read this book, what you see is that God works in his own time, not because he's slack. It, it says something in here about, you know, although it seems like I'm going to tarry, I'm not really tarrying because the Lord is merciful and he's patient and he gives people time to repent. That's why the Lord appears to be slow in doing things. I think part of the incredible work the Lord is doing with evil is he's showing everyone. 
Everything the Lord does is educational. He's letting people see. Because you can tell people about good and evil in a book that you yourself, God, inspire and make perfect. And some people will read the book and believe in it. A lot of people won't even read the book. You know, a lot of people will watch a video that laughs at the book and think, ha the book's foolish. But if you take what's in this book and you display it throughout the entire earth, man, think of what a powerful sign that is. And that's what God's doing all the time. He's like, yeah, here's the book. Here's the guide. But you want to see the movie <laughs> with your own eyes? Look at what I do with all of history. And so the Lord gives time so that we can see the results of evil. We can see it blooming and prospering. But at the end, the Lord is like doing this great sign, this great display that everyone can see. And that will bring many souls to salvation. And the key thing is we got to have patience, patience. So if you want to make the Lord really happy today, then do what Job or Habakkuk did. Even when the trees are not blossoming and everything's falling apart, whether in your personal life or in our current world of iniquity, Re-up on your faith in the Lord and say, despite all this, you are my refuge. You are my strength, O Lord. And the Lord really likes that attitude because he will do what he's going to do. But the question is, do we have enough patience? Do we have enough faith? You know, something that I've fallen into since I was reborn. I, th I think we all have at times is basically this. And my, for me, at least, it took me 37 years to come to the Lord. I went off into AA, into Hinduism. I did drugs. I tried to become a master fornicator. I did all this different stuff and took, you know, all these winding paths. Then finally, when I'm 37, I come to the Lord, you know, and I'm like, oh, the Lord saved me because I believed in the gospel. Oh, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thanks for being so patient. Thanks for not striking me down despite all my sins. Wow, Lord, you were waiting there all along. You let me explore all these other paths. Finally, when I came to Jesus after 37 years, you saved me. And then you're like, okay, Lord, now hurry up and judge everyone else. Rapture us out of here and drop the bombs. Let's go. <laughs> you know, you can see the mistake that we can make sometimes that we're like, all right, Lord, take your time when it comes to judging my sin and saving me. Give me all the time in the world. But once I've got on the right side of it, now hurry up, Lord, and just burn them all. <laughs> you know, we can all fall into that attitude. When I first read the book of Revelation, I was like, awesome, Lord. Oh, come on, Lord. Any day now, Lord, we're ready for it. You know, so that's a mistake we can all make is that, you know, since the Lord was very patient with all of us and since he's very patient when we sin, even after we're reborn, I've committed a bunch of sins. The Lord's been very patient with me. He's still patient with me today with a bunch of my sins, as he is with all of you who are watching this video. So, you know, aren't we all so happy when the Lord extends great patience and mercy and slowness to anger with us in our personal lives? Well, that's why it seems to be taking him a while with everything, because he's extending that to everyone, not just us. We can't just be like, yo, I'm saved. Okay, we're done. Rapture tonight. Everyone else, if you didn't make it by now, you're, you're, you're toast. You know, that's not a good attitude. So the Lord will do it. It's written. There's one iron rule of this universe is that if it's written in this book, it's going to happen. This book has 100% accuracy rate up till now. It's going to happen. The tribulation will drop, the rapture will happen, all that stuff will come to pass, but the Lord is being patient and merciful with everyone, giving them a chance and giving us a chance to help them and giving us a chance to reap more heavenly rewards. So if you want to make the Lord happy today, be patient with him. And a, a mental trick I use is the things that I know the Lord is going to do, whether in my own life or in the world, I try to act as if they've already happened, you know? In my mind, I try to act like, you know, the stuff that I want to come, the things that I know are, are good works the Lord desires for me, I try to feel in my mind as if it's already done. Because in heaven, it is already done. It's already written. You know, I don't try to think, oh, will it happen? Will it not? I try to think, you know, these, these blessings that I want, the good works, the things that I want to accomplish, I think like as if with the Lord's help, I've already accomplished them. I don't try to think, will they happen? I think I know they'll happen. I don't know the details. I don't know exactly how the Lord will do it, but I know he will because that's his character. That's what he does. And then I try to live as if it's already come to pass, as if already, you know, the, the various good works I want to achieve and the things I hope for in my life that I know are things the Lord would want for me. You know, I trust him. I have faith. And I try to live as if it's already been done, as if like, oh, cool. Well, that's been taken care of. Why? Because I have faith in him. I trust in him. And I think that's the attitude we're seeing with Job or with Habakkuk, that they're like, even though things look bad out there, I know how the Lord will act. And that's kind of what the Lord reminds them. You know, I am the Lord. I'm going to do what I say I'll do. Don't be distressed by the outward appearance. The Lord is using this all to do a great work beyond our understanding. And ultimately, he's going to save a lot of souls through this evil that we see. 
you know, and if he's been watching this evil for thousands of years and tolerating it, surely we can tolerate it a bit longer, you know, and, and hey, let's get out there and help him and win souls and stuff. But I know that having that patience, not just saying like, you know, it's easy to, to thank the Lord and rejoice in him when he does good stuff in your life. You know, like, wow, thank you, Lord. That's awesome. But you want to take it to a higher level, rejoice and thank him even when things aren't going well in your life. Be like, I know you're going to fix this, Lord. I know this is nothing for you. I'm rejoicing already. I think he really likes that attitude because that really shows your faith. You know, the chapter, I forget where it is in the scripture when when the Lord is like listing different people who had faith like Abraham and Noah and so on. Like they had faith by being patient and waiting. You know, you see that 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 a big aspect of faith is like endurance and patience and not getting miserable and being like, well, when he eventually does it, I'll be happy and thank him if he does it. No, no, be like, of course he's going to do it. He's the Lord. He is a redeemer. He's a savior. That's his character. What he's going to give us is even better than what we can imagine, but we have to be patient. And if it doesn't happen in this life, it will happen in the afterlife when we're with him. You can bank on that because the Lord is great. The Lord is just, and he loves to make us happy. But we have to have patience. So let's have patience. Let's rejoice. He will do the things that you want in your life, probably much better than you even want, like because that's how he is. He's just like that. He's awesome. You know, you're serving him as well. Well, you know what I'm talking about. And if you're not, now's a really good time to get saved because she also mentioned the counter side of the coin, which is that he also can drop the bomb at any time. And when we're, uh, you know, looking at the scripture, what you see is that when the day of the Lord comes, whether it's the official day of the Lord or it's kind of like the mini pre-days of the Lord, like when he, you know, swallowed up the Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea or when the writing on the wall episode, when suddenly all of the, uh, the Babylonians got uh, slain, you know. When the Lord's judgment comes, it often comes very unexpectedly, very swiftly, and very brutally. And it's good to remember that too, because if you're saved, have patience, have faith. But if you're not saved, now is a good time to get saved, because the pattern of how the Lord operates is that when he drops it, man, he drops it fast, brutally, and that, that ain't no ball game in the park. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So uh, that's enough mixed metaphors. Uh for me for today, but I hope you enjoyed this uh, quick little view of my, one man's attempt to understand a bunch of ancient names in an ancient book. So blow the dust off yours, you know, and join me and uh, try to comprehend the deeper things of the Lord. And if you have any thoughts about it, please share them with me. This is one man alone in his room with the word of God uh, and love for all the brethren uh, of Christ. Thank you for watching the video and let's keep serving the Lord. We know he's going to do great things for us. We really are so fortunate if you know the Lord Jesus, because we know what's coming on this world and most people have no idea and they're lining up to worship the AI idol demon that they're building with their own hands and that is not going to go well. Uh, so let's try to warn them and try to help them. Uh, ultimately, it's up to them if they listen or not, but you know, let's just pray for them because that probably is better than trying to logically convince people at this point, because people believe all kinds of insane stuff now. They pretty much are worshiping AI already. Yeah, we can see what's coming with that one. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for watching the video. Uh, a salute to all the brethren fighting on behalf of our Lord and the spiritual battlefields out there. I'll see you guys again soon, possibly up in the sky at the wedding banquet. In Jesus Christ's name, may the peace and glory of our Lord rest upon each and every one of you. For the honor of God the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Christ Jesus, the Great. Amen.